And also, the papacy changed the second commandment, which forbids the worshipping of graven images. And that's why you can see them bowing down to statues of Mary and statues of St. Peter and statues of all type of other people that I don't even know of. You get, my, you get in the picture here? I'm sure you are. So what we're looking at in this miry clay and this union of the iron and the potter's clay, we are looking at a union of church and state. And at that time, it was the papacy. The papacy ran, the papacy reigned. It really began to gain its great strength when Clovis, the king of the Franks, matter of fact, gave the first crown to a pope in the year 508, um, 508 AD. And the papacy really solidified its stranglehold on the world in 538 AD and then went all the way to 1798 AD. However, now let's get to the interesting part in dealing with the New World Order that you've been waiting to hear about all throughout this video. At the end of that prophetic dream that Nebuchadnezzar had, he saw a stone that was cut out without hands and that stone smote the image in its feet of iron and clay. And when that happened, the whole image was destroyed together. Now that stone is a symbol of Jesus. We can prove this from the scriptures. In matter of fact, in the book of Matthew chapter 21 and verse 42, Jesus himself said, Did ye never read in the scriptures that the stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head cornerstone? This is the Lord's doing and is marvelous in our eyes. Notice that Jesus said the stone which become the, became the head cornerstone, it was of the Lord's doing, meaning that no man had anything to do it. Do with it. It was God and God himself that made that a reality. And this directly connects to what we see in Daniel chapter 2 because it says the stone was cut out without hands, meaning there was no human instrumentality connected to that stone being cut out. It was God himself that did, did it. It was the Lord's doing. We're talking about Jesus Christ. That stone coming and smiting the image in its feet is symbolic of Jesus Christ's second coming and establishing God's eternal kingdom in this earth. I can prove that again from Daniel chapter 2 and verse 44. It says there, And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven shall set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall destroy and consume all these other kingdoms and shall stand forever, for as much as thou sawest a stone cut out of a mountain without hands, and that, it break, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God hath made known to thee, O king, what shall come to pass hereafter. The dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof is sure. So clearly, that stone, which comes out of a mountain and it's cut out without hands and it comes and, smite this Im and smites the image in its feet and destroys the whole image is symbolic of Jesus Christ coming back to planet earth and establishing God's heavenly kingdom which shall endure forever. But this is very interesting. Why do I say it's very interesting? It says that the stone will smite the image not in its head, not in its belly, not in its legs, but in its feet that were a mixture of iron and clay. Now previously, we identified the fact that that mixture of iron and potter's clay, which turned to miry clay, was symbolic of the union of church and state, which brought about the existence of the Papal Roman Empire. Now the papacy reigned as a worldwide superpower from the years 538 to 1798. Even a little bit, it started gaining its strength in 476. The first pope actually received the crown in the year 508 from Clovis, the king of the Franks. But it gained its strong armor, this strong clasp around the globe in the year 538 to 1798. But however, at 1798, it lost its strength as a worldwide superpower. But we're told in this prophetic dream that when the stone comes, it hits the image in the feet of iron and clay. Now question, did Jesus Christ come back between the years 538 and 1798 when the papacy was ruling with this church and state government mixture? No, Jesus didn't come back between 538 and 1798. If he did, I wouldn't be here talking about it right now. But this lets us know something. It lets us know clearly something that we already know, and that's that 
the coming of Jesus Christ is a future event. But we are told there that when he comes, he will smite the image in its feet that are made up of iron and clay. In other words, the Bible is letting us know when Jesus Christ comes back to this earth to establish God's eternal kingdom, he will overthrow a worldwide governing superpower that will unite church and state on a global scale. That's what the iron and clay is. Wow. And what we are looking at is the formation of the new world order. And the government structure of the new world order will be a government that unites church and state. There's still ten toes on that feet, on the feet of the image. That lets us know that this world will be divided into ten divisions. Did you know that the United Nations has our world divided up into 10 sectors at this time for financial purposes? You see it on your screen right now if you didn't know before. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. When Jesus Christ comes back, which is going to be very soon, there will be a global government structure, the New World Order, and it will, and it will be a union of church and state. That's right. Now let's talk about something else. How did that union of church and state come about before? Remember, I told you that that whole union of church and state was cemented in the year 321 AD when Constantine the Great passed that Sunday law. But something's very interesting. What's very interesting is why Constantine the Great passed that Sunday law. I'm going to tell you right, right now. There was feuding going on in the pagan Roman Empire. The Rome, Rome was in complete civil unrest because the pagans were at war with the Christians. And Rome was actually being threatened to be separated because of this civil unrest. For all purposes and intentions, there was civil war within the Roman Empire. And for the purpose of quenching this civil unrest... Constantine the Great instituted this Sunday law because he knew that it would be common ground for the pagans and that it would also be a form of common ground on which the Christians would compromise to stand on with the pagans to bring about peace, to end the civil war that was going on within the pagan Roman Empire. So notice that civil war was the catalyst for the instituting of a Sunday law which brought about the cementing of a union of church and state. Ladies and gentlemen, if you didn't know, the United States of America is right on the precipice of the opening up of a civil war. When the gas prices shoot up to eight, 10, $12 per gallon, and the diesel prices shoot up to nine, 11, and $13 per gallon, and they will shoot up that high when we go to war with Iran, that means that our food prices are going to shoot out of the building. And as they say, a hungry man is an angry man. Prepare for civil war in the United States. And when this civil war comes about, then there will be martial law. And then to bring about some type of morals into our society. And to quench the anger of the masses. And to bring about union between the, between the different factions that will be warring they will institute a Sunday law in our country. There will be a union of church and state. This is the forerunner. And whether you like it or not, and whether you believe it or not, one day very soon, you will find out that the truth is the truth.